Welcome everyone. Happy end of summer. <laughs> Just in time to call the meeting to order. <laughs> Minutes of June twelfth, two thousand thirteen. Motion to approve the minutes of June twelfth, two thousand thirteen. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion, notations, comments? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed abstentions, it's unanimous. And uh, the financial statement. Good evening, everyone. Good nice evening, to be yeah. um, Tonight you have two um, financial statements, one from the end of last year and one from the beginning of this year. Um, you can tell them apart because the fiscal year date is in the upper left-hand corner. So I'm going to start with the 2012-2013 one. And if you look at the last page, we expended all of our budget except for about $733. And that was a difference between what we had encumbered and what we actually had the bills come in at. We were able to make all the purchases at year end for the technology and the school improvements that you had approved, such as the design fees for the door and the playground upgrades. Um, unfortunately, neither has happened yet. <laughs> um, this year, we're just starting to pay some of our uh, summer program expenses as well as our regular monthly expenses such as utilities and, and transportation. Uh, and payroll for teaching staff will begin next month. There are a total of nine warrants for you to sign tonight. Um, there's some encumbered funds. There's the nature's glass from revolving, fiscal agent payroll for August. The monthly expenditure warrant, an after school program, the River Valley Day Camp, the summer day break, and school choice. We also have the payroll sheets for the 12 periods. That'll take us to the half year so that you wouldn't have to sign those afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Good question. Um, did, on the expenses that you said we've paid for but they haven't happened yet, mm -hmm. did, did you mean that we've you've actually spent money on things or just that it's budgeted so it's taken We've care of? We've encumbered the funds to have the projects happen, but the projects haven't happened yet. Um, the door project, um, we, we had, uh, you had to given us authorization to pay for the design fees. Right. Um, the door project that. got pushed back because of the lead time on the doors was a lot mm -hmm. longer than they had anticipated. And um, the playground uh, improvements haven't happened yet because Mr. Lesko has been busy with all the other summer cleaning and everything. So that'll happen probably this fall. But we've encumbered the funds, set them aside. Set them aside. Set yeah. them aside okay. so that we'll be able to pay th for the expenses when they do occur. Without impacting this year. Without impacting <laughs> this year, exactly. So. What happens to the seven hundred and thirty three dollars left over? That gets Does returned that to that time. And there still may be some difference there, Mary, as we pay the left of the encumbrances. Like okay. there could be a difference yeah. in shipping what we estimated and what it actually came in. So it could be a little higher when all is said and done and all the encumbrances are are, are flushed out. Okay. Very good. Just kind of what happens if that number is negative? Just practically speaking it, with it, us in the town, if, if this came out to, you know, end of last fiscal year, negative $1,200. We, we would then, we, we, I would have come to you at the end of the year and told you that I was forecasting a deficit and we would have probably requested to use some school choice funds to offset the deficit because we can't end in a deficit. And, and the other possibility above and beyond that is to ask the town to consider a warrant article to give us the money to somehow fund the expenditure. But if it's in the right price range, normally, I should say, as Patty said, it would probably come from school choice. That's really only the that's really the only revolving type fund we have available to us anymore. So. Thanks. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. 
Hearing none, we have a public comment. Do we have any public comment tonight? The silent, <laughs> the silent public. Well, I'll I'll take the public comment opportunity to say welcome to Marty as our new superintendent. Thank it's you. Nice to have you here, and nice to be uh, here. It's been nice to get your communications during the mm -hmm. summer, and uh, an update on where you stand. So sure, welcome and thank you. We look forward to working with you. <clears throat> uh, we can cover unfinished business pretty quickly. There isn't any. <laughs> That's right. And we're down to new business. Um, and we get to talk about policy proposals. Did we have a presentation tonight or is she? She um, is, is coming. I told her okay. she was on right after the uh, policy. So. Okay. Um, that That's was good. the we've, plan. We've got a surprise agenda item. <laughs> Louise is coming in to talk about report cards. So just to let people know if we want to put that under reports maybe, or I don't know where you want it. Well, I was thinking maybe after uh, after we discuss the policies. Okay. And, mm -hmm. um, sure. Because I know Janine's including some of the uh, summer maintenance projects and yes. mm -hmm. um, personnel changes are all under the principal's yep. report. Okay. So. Sounds good. Okay. So, we'll begin with the alphabetized policies. Well, I can talk a little bit about these. These are not, you know, terribly exciting policies, but when we, when we see that we can simplify things or clarify things, um, we try to do that. So, as has been past practice, we hand out the proposed polic policies to you one month, and we vote on them the next month. Um, the slightly confusing thing with, with these policies is that they don't convert apples to apples. So in other words, when you look at some of the existing policies regarding agenda preparation and dissemination, and then you look at the proposed policies, um, it's not exactly the same wording. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is that they're very specific, they incorporate any new changes to the law, um, I would encourage everyone, especially having to do with uh, open session and executive session, to read up on the proposed policies. These are policies that have been followed um, by local uh, school districts, and they were all examined by our attorneys prior to bringing them to your attention. So, so that's what I have, and I would ask that they then be put on the agenda for... Um, approval for the October meeting. Okay? Yes. And one question I had, it's not a term that I've seen very often, or maybe I've just never really recognized it, but I'm, I'm wondering what constitutes the executive staff? I, the exa where did you see that, Kevin? It's in the I very know. first sentence under agenda preparation and dissemination. Is this for the new one? The yes, for the new or? one and the old one. It's in both. Um, but it's in consultation with the superintendent of schools and appropriate members of well, the Well, it's a new term that I've coined. So, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to ask for clarification on that because I'm not sure exactly who that refers to. I would assume but it's, it's the, I would assume, I would it's assume it would be this group, yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, but I've never, I'm, it, nothing, no offense intended, if we, <laughs> if we have executive staff, that's wonderful, but I've always thought of them as administrative right, colleagues. Right. As opposed they to are. Staff. They are. Yeah, would you like to, to do that? CEO. We can CEO, sure. Here. You know what? Let me ask for clarification on that because sure. I would assume also that it would refer to the principal and the assistant principal. Yeah. I think that, that was really my my primary question as I read it. Um, everything else seems to follow along pretty well, but executive staff just struck me as nothing I'd seen in any of our other policies. So we we did <laughs> borrow this from Amherst. And so perhaps it's a term. <laughs> there's the, the, there's the explanation. Yeah, there's <laughs> the answer. There it is. Uh, change it to administrative Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just. Yeah. For, yeah, that or senior sense. Because that's what it's staff. intended for. You put so. your right. senior administrative right. staff as opposed to just what, however you wish to do it. With, it's like, I don't know who the executive staff is. I don't know who I'm supposed to consult with here. I don't either, so we'll change it. Okay. Um, I have not seen 
<clears throat> anything else that really jumped out at me. So. Except that you're now in control of the committee. That's right. <laughs> right? But you weren't before. Mm -hmm. According to this. Right. Mm -hmm. and the agenda said. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I prefer the superintendent in consultation with the, <laughs> the chair, but if, it, if we want to word it this way, there are probably some chairpersons that would like to uh, have total control. <clears throat> so. So. so, any other comments on the... Oh, well, the next thing I, I had suggested that yeah, maybe we have Louise. So, Louise? She did make it. She's here. Hello, Louise. Yeah, one of the things, um, Louise is going to pass out some materials, but um, I know you've heard a lot about the uh, Common Core Standards and um, perhaps PARC and the new evaluation system. And... <coughs> One of the things that's come out of that the is uh, the proposed new uh, report card system. Where would you like to sit? We have an extra chair. Okay. And the teachers in Deerfield are going to be presenting information to parents on open house. Yes. So we had thought, which is why it was not included on your agenda, we realized that your open house is prior to uh, the next school committee meeting. So we are going to have, uh, Louise is going to be going to each of the school committees in September um, to present the new report, report card. Usually you see me at MCAS time, but <laughs> this, is, um, this is actually more fun. Good evening. Glad to see everybody. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, worked for the last year on examining our report card because it no longer matched the standards that we we're being asked to teach with the Common Core, the Massachusetts standards, and teachers were struggling with how to take a document that was created 12 years ago, which is the report card we've had, with standards that we're now teaching. So I'm going to take you through some of the rationale and, and show you, give you a sneak preview on what it looks like. So in these um, folders, on your right is the retiring report card, and behind it is the new one. And um, behind that is a parent guide. This is a draft. I still have to tweak it a bit, but we're going to give parents a lot of information about what these new report cards mean. So <coughs> I'm going to start with um, what is a description of what standards-based grading is. You've all heard of the, the Common Core standards, these new national standards that have been sweeping the, the country. Um, 47 states originally signed on to them. They're standards in math and English language arts. A few um, states are starting to pull out of the Common Core standards. Um, some of us speculate that they don't want to be compared to students in Massachusetts. Massachusetts students are the highest achieving students nationally and they're creating some exams, the PARC and the um, Smarter Balanced, that are uh, assessing kids against the same standards. So um, there is speculation that those uh, states that are lower achieving are getting very concerned about how their students are going to look and how their schools are going to look. But we're hanging in there, Massachusetts, because these standards come from a long line of research and they are rigorous and they're actually quite exciting. So we teach the standards. And now we want our reporting system to match those standards. So what does that mean? Well, on the left is a, is a yellow piece of paper. I'll take you through some of what is recommended um, about standards-based report cards. First, they should be clear and meaningful to all the stakeholders, meaning the students, the teachers, families, and anybody else who needs to understand what is on that report card. So how are we going to help make that happen? Well, teachers are going to distribute them at open house. I'm planning to make um, a, I was originally going to do a video, but I think I'm going to do a screencast showing the different components. And a screencast is like a slideshow where 
people will be looking at the components of the report card while I narrate it, so that that will be consistent. Um, and parents will be given copies, a blank one, of course, that doesn't have grades in it, so they can take it home in September. And then if they have questions, they're actually not being distributed until December, so they have a long time to sort of ask questions. They'll also be um, di uh, discussed at uh, parent-teacher conferences in October where teachers can give an update. So I'm just giving you the background on how we're planning to roll these out. Um, also, the, the recommendation is that grades should reflect academic standards demonstrating what students know and are able to do. We're taking away any hint of subjectivity. Traditional grades, A, B, C, um, are as variable as the individual's grading students. Anybody who's been through a school that has more than one teacher knows that um, actually the variability all lies in the teacher. Students can have the exact same skills and from one teacher to the next get a very different grade depending on teachers weighted, what kinds of questions they ask, etc. We're taking that away. It's too important that students achieve these high standards to leave that to any question or any doubt. So um, all of our grades are going to reflect uh, learning targets that are aligned to our curriculum, and I'll take you into the specifics of that. Non-academic indicators um, are important to understanding how the, whole, the student uh, interacts in school, understanding about the student, but they should be reported separately from academic grades. In other words, behavior. That shouldn't be factored into your math grade. Um, you know, d turning something in late even, that's a behavior. That's not how well you do math. Um, so we have separated those. We still comment on those. Students are still held accountable for turning homework in, for um, turning things in on time, et cetera. But they're not averaged into any kind of grade because it, um, it often is a, an issue of behavior, not academic ability. Um, so those are separated on our report card. <coughs> um, teaching essential standards. Um, and providing multiple opportunities and methods for determining proficiency. Everything isn't going to hinge on one assessment. We're asking teachers to look for what we call evidence of student learning in their daily work, in their homework, in a, uh, small assessments that are done in school, in performances. There are lots of opportunities to look for evidence that a student understands something. And um, a, a quality uh, report card needs quality assessments and rubrics um, behind them. And I'm going to show you just a few of what we are bringing into the district to ensure that we are being standards based and that we have a clear definition of what those standards, what does third grade standard in computation look like? What do students have to be able to do? What do they have to understand? And also professional development. Um, including the work of grade level professional learning communities. We are getting together frequently throughout the year with grade levels to look at student work, primarily in writing, to um, ensure that we have calibrated our standards, that one teacher scores exactly the same as another teacher. What's going to be worth four points in one class would be four points in the other. So we're going to be working on that. So what, is, what does the report card look like? So these are, these are what is recommended to ensure that it's successful and that it's held to a high standard. Um, on the back are some do's and don'ts that I'm planning to go over with teachers, and we don't have to go through each of those, but these are um, recommended from, uh, this is the work of a, a gentleman named Michael Connor, who has written widely on uh, standards-based grading. And there's some very, um, strong recommendations on there that we still have high expectations of behaviors but we're not factoring them into grades. Um, we still have collaborative and cooperative groups but group grades don't count as a grade for a child. Um, knowing and understanding those standards, etc. So this is a, a huge list that really most of our teachers practice already embraces most of this. But we'll be ensuring that everybody understands all of these do's and don'ts. So here's our re what I call our retiring report card. It's probably familiar to any of you who've looked at your own children's report card. We, this is, I took a fourth grade example. So taking a look at it, we used to have 
A, standards met and work is outstanding. Okay. But what does that mean? There wasn't a clear definition of that. What is outstanding work for one in one classroom might not be the same definition as another teacher across town, as another teacher right next door. B, meet standards. C, approaching standards. This was our first attempt at going standards-based, but it was really a half step. We've taken a further step. We also graded on progress. Excellent progress, good <coughs> progress, some progress, minimal progress. Very subjective, frankly. We, we made an effort to get consistent there, but it still um, had a level of subjectivity. And then looking down to reading, there was one grade for overall achievement, and then we commented on the progress in comprehension, fluency, decoding. So let's take a look at the new one just for a comparison. Here is the new report card. The first thing you'll notice, the old one just had sort of um, on the front was uh, a picture. On the front of the new report card are skills that support learning. The teachers requested that it was the first thing because these are all really the behaviors that matter no matter whose classroom a student is in. So following the rules and procedures, demonstrating respect, solving problems, um, listening actively, etc. These are the things that across the board are good school behaviors, skills that support a learning environment, skills that support a student in learning. So that's coming A number one. Um, and that's something that uh, parents care very much about <laughs> seeing first. How is the student um, interacting with peers and how are they setting habits and lifelong habits of learning? And so our new key for the skills that support learning, M means meets the expectations that the student is consistently demonstrating that skill. So for instance, keeps materials and workspace space organized. There are some students consistently who can do that and who demonstrate that. And there are some students for whom it's, it's still challenging. They might get a progressing. They've seen some growth. For a student who isn't making any progress there, a parent would know that too, growth needed. That would be the indicator. Behaviors and skills do not meet expectations Additional practice and growth needed. That's um, very clear. And then for some students who do this, can demonstrate a skill so successfully and consistently with very little support, they would exceed the expectation. We expect students need help, support, reminders. But for some students, um, we can give them that M plus. They have mastered it, they have met the expectations and done more. So that's for the behaviors. Inside, Taking a look at reading, where before there was one grade and three little progress indicators, we've now followed the Common Core and Massachusetts standards, and students will get a score in how well they are achieving the standards broken down by literature, informational text, and then foundational skills. Because some students might really excel at reading poetry and stories, and then informational text is challenging. So how did we do with that with before? You know, we didn't have, we didn't have an opportunity to, to um, sh demonstrate that in our old report card. So this gives parents much more information about specifically which skills that match the new Common Core, our new Massachusetts standards, their students, their children are mastering an M, in the academic um, key, M is mastery. You have got it. Master this skill. P, progressing. B, beginning. N, not yet. And then for students who've gone beyond mastery, and I'll show you how we're going to tell that, um, they would get an M+. Plus. That means you've mastered it, and then you are going beyond your grade level expectations. So those are, that's just, for instance, reading, writing. We used to have one grade. Students would get a B in writing, and then a, a developing um, how well they were progressing in topic development and conventions. We've now broken it down by the genres that students are going to be responsible for writing. So they might have a strength in writing narratives, but not as much in informational text. 
parents will know specifically what their children are excelling at and where they're needing to do some more work. Math, just a glance at it, one grade versus the right side of the page, it is broken down by all of the domains. The purpose for this is not to overwhelm people, but to pinpoint exactly how students are doing in these new standards and to make clear to students, you didn't earn an A, your learning has demonstrated mastery of multi-step word, word problems. You've demonstrated mastery of understanding factors, but you're progressing in analyzing number and shape patterns. We're going to have evidence. What teachers are going to be doing is collecting evidence of that. So there's some of the differences, I'm not going to take you through everything, of what our retiring report card that does no, no longer serves this, our, our purpose, our need, and the new one. So how are we going to tell if a student's mastering? Well, we have a number of assessments in this multicolored packet. Um, this is evidence of learning. As I said, we're looking for evidence, not just test scores, not just one time, but where is the evidence? We do have some on-demand um, assessments. We're now going to have an on-demand, meaning students will do it in class within a particular period of time, pre and post, before a unit to see what the student's skills are before teaching and after the instruction to see the growth. The now, we're now going to um, administer those in narrative writing, informative, and opinion, as well as writing about reading and what is called a CEPA, Curriculum Embedded Performance Assessment. These are some things that we've piloted this spring, and um, teachers are going to identify one that they're going, to, um, they're going to implement in their classrooms. And these integrate content into writing and reading. So for instance, in third grade, Simple Machines is one of our science units. Students will read about Simple Machines, do experiments about Simple Machines, and then their SIPA, their Curriculum Embedded Performance Assessment, will be writing an editorial, identifying which Simple Machine benefits people's lives the most, and quoting from the text. There's rigor here. These are the kinds of skills that we didn't use to ask third graders or elementary students to achieve, and the new standards are um, demanding that, and we are teaching to it, and we now have um, assessments in those areas. And I'll give you on the left, I'm going to show you how we can tell if a student is on grade level or not. Here's an example from the Lucy Coffin's writing. It's a rubric. We are going to increasingly be using rubrics, and this rubric is a really good example because this is for fifth grade informational writing. And the student is right piece of writing will be scored on various dimensions. And as you can see across the top, it says grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six. That's because if it's a fifth grade student and their work is in the grade three area, we know they're not mastering the grade level. But it also shows us what the next step is with that student. So, um, for instance, in overall, for informative writing, a grade five grade level piece, the writer would use different kinds of information to teach about the subject, sometimes including little essay stories or how to. But a student down at a third grade level would teach readers, put in ideas or observations. It wouldn't be as elaborate as what we see at fifth grade. At the same time, an advanced student there's a very clear descriptive of what sixth grade looks like. So it's no longer an opinion of an individual teacher that this student is above grade level. There are clear, specific descriptors that we can use to have evidence of exactly where a student is on that continuum. It's a process. It's a lot of learning for all of us. But we're going to be working very hard and regularly with teachers to ensure that we have what I call calibrated our scores, that your four is the same as my four, and that we agree on it. And we're going to do that by looking at lots and lots of examples, authentic examples of student work. And so I've included a few just examples of the kinds of work we'll be doing to measure 
that, and I also included uh, in, in many of them a little kindergarten piece. There's an example, and we're starting to um, scan in pieces that are evidence of either meeting or exceeding the grade level so that teachers can look at real pieces of our real students that really meet or exceed standards to ensure calibration. And we also show those to students. So if we're starting an, a unit on opinions, we can show first graders or third graders, here's a real opinion piece somebody, a child wrote in our school or in our district. So that's where we're heading with our new report cards. They're going to be, um, they're going to be distributed three times a year as opposed to twice. So parents will have an opportunity to see how their child is doing more frequently. And um, there's more, they're more descriptive and they're more standards based. Up. Any questions? <laughs> I, I have a question. These yeah. are not only are they standards based; they appear to be grades based. So, are you going to have a grade four, grade five, a grade oh, six? Oh yes, this so is just have yes. A standard report card. Yes. And as you look at, as I look at the Common Core or the standards within yes. each subject area, isn't there a possibility that those could change from year to year? Well, third grade is going to have different standards. No, no, I'm, yeah. I'm not talking between the grades. You mean in the state? In the state, or is there a possibility that these documents will need to be revised or reassessed every year to make sure that the standards are... Well, we'll ensure. Yeah, we'll look at them. And the beauty of, uh, the beauty of digital world is that if something becomes uh, no longer uh, no longer matching what we're doing, we can delete it. Mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah, this is, this is what we're rolling out. If we're finding that parents are struggling to understand it or students or it's not meeting our needs, um, I'm actually going to invite parents to give us feedback. Um, it's at the end of my uh, pamphlet with my name and, and phone number, but I also will in the um, voiceover to say, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask, or if you have feedback, if this is better information or if this information is confusing, we want to hear, we want to have that dialogue. But until parents get one, they won't be able to give us real dialogue because they know their child and they see this new document and whether it rings true to what they're understanding. So certainly this could change as the standards change. I don't anticipate the Common Core is going to change for a while. They are um, nationally, they're spending lots of money developing assessments based on these. Mm -hmm. In fact, we'll be piloting, not in this school. Our district is piloting. Not Deerfield. Not Deerfield. Some of our schools Some have our chosen yes. to pilot um, the new assessment, which I'm actually thrilled because <coughs> it'll give us a peek into what it's like for our kids. It won't count, but they will participate in, in three of our schools. Mm -hmm. Frontier and two of our elementary schools have been randomly selected by the Department of Ed to their first rollout of what's called PARC, the, the new uh, test that's being developed on, uh, by many states, a coalition. And um, it will give us information about how students respond. We're going to ask the kids after, what was that like? Was it hard? Was it easy? Was it fun? <clears throat> They're trying to make them computer-based. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of changes, and we're doing our very best to keep up with them. Um, frankly, do we have every single piece of the curriculum perfectly in place right now? No, we're continually working on it. But we didn't want to wait until everything was totally in place and shackle teachers to an old report card mm -hmm. dated, no longer reflecting current thinking about learning. So we're all in a transition and a learning. Um, if you go out on the internet nationally, <coughs> everybody's putting out standards-based report cards from Oregon to California to Colorado, across this state, I've counted 50 or 60 communities that already have them posted on their websites. We're not that different in how we're looking at this. In other words, does the student meet this standard? And the standards are aligned um, with the Common Core. So we're not doing anything that different than what others are doing. We're all being asked to keep up as best we can with these changes. And the changes actually, I think, are good. We're asking students to do more meaningful kind of tasks for assessments. I mean, writing an editorial, which, which simple machine would you think is most useful? That's, that's meaningful because you've studied something and now you put into words your opinion based on information. And this all came, you know, Common Core came from college and career readiness. The colleges were saying, 
students can't write these papers. They, won't, they want to write these personal narratives. We, for years, have taught kids to write good personal narratives, write about the time you went to grandma's house. <clears throat> but an academic skill, an important one, is removing yourself from your own opinion and citing evidence from texts. And that is the huge um, focus, of one of the huge shifts in the Common Core. So we're teaching children from very, very young to write informational texts. I put that little kindergarten sample in. Kindergartner wrote, read books about plants and wrote that piece, 14-page book with information about plants. We didn't used to do that kind of writing. So. Is, this a, um, are you, is this sort of moving up the age chain, too? I mean, is this kind of focus happening in middle and high school in terms of changing their grading? Middle school is looking a lot at some very similar things. They're using rubrics. In fact, um, Sarah Mitchell, who's the secondary uh, director, and I were just examining um, a new publication by Marzano, who's one of the big names in the field, that has rubrics for every single subject up through 12th grade. They have embedded rubrics into their standards grading. Secondary, they might stay with grades for a while longer because their concern is college GPA, you know, college is looking at GPA. However, that might shift. I can't speak for them, but I know Sarah and I have um, worked closely together on looking at similar kinds of ways to look at student work and that the key is calibrating our understanding of what is meeting standards. They may still call it ABC up there, but it's going to be much more tightly aligned to the, the same continuum of standards. So students are writing argument, opinion, and narrative up at Frontier, too. Um, so we're more tightly aligned than we've ever been, but some, some things are a little bit different. And, and the conversation about whether we want to move to the ABC at secondary, that's still an open conversation. For elementary students, it, it makes a lot of sense to get much more specific in their early years of learning to make very clear to them this is the goal. We call them targets. This is the learning target. How close are you? It's a continuum. You'll get there, but you know, where are you on the continuum? So we're having that conversation, but we're not completely there yet. I suspect the middle and high school teachers aren't going to want you to take behavior out of the grading system. That you mean averaging it in? No, taking it out like you are in elementary. Yeah. I suspect they would like that tool to stay there. For they do have a weighted visible. system there, which it's open for discussion <clears throat> as to how much weight and importance they put on homework and behavior. Um, but I was telling Louise, there are a number of charter schools, high schools, that have standards-based report cards. And that does not seem to have uh, hurt them when they apply to college. So I think it's the natural progression as we introduce here at the elementary school. Yeah, and, and the research is very clear. You need to separate those two um, and, and clarify where students' learning is versus, you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they didn't hand, they handed it in a day late. Does that mean they don't know it? We will, that will be graded. If you're handing things in late, parents will know it from the front of the report card, but it's not going to be averaged in. Um, so. Did you have a committee of teachers and yes. administration to develop this together? Yes. Yes, I didn't dream it up by myself. <laughs> and it was in development all last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is not, this has been the culminating you know, project of a year's worth of study and discussion. Yeah, and then we brought grade levels together, mm -hmm. and they commented and said, ooh, this, you know, you, you didn't put this in. This is really important in our grade level. So we did it grade level by grade level. Teachers got drafts, gave feedback, and, um, you know, it's, it's a, a really a collaborative effort. So I'm excited about it. I think it's, it's more informative. The, the, the shift, and I will forewarn all of us, the shift that's going to be challenging for some is moving away from grades in grades four, five, six. Mm -hmm. Teachers are delighted because they understand that giving a student a grade isn't as clear as standards, telling you which standards you're achieving and where you are on that continuum. But families are accustomed to grades, and they understand what or what they think that means. And so we're going to have to do a lot of education around that. And 
I am very open to any questions and will welcome and invite dialogue with families about what, what does this mean and how can we move it to a place where your child understands it, you understand it, and you're comfortable with it. But that, that's sometimes some communities who introduce them too quickly without helping, giving parents time to digest. They can take it home and look at it and call me up and say, what, why is this on it, before their child ever gets it, you know, the blank. They sometimes run into trouble when the first time a parent has, a parents have ever heard about it is when their child comes home with it. We are not planning to do that. We're planning to give parents lots of opportunity to digest, ask questions, and understand it. And you said at the open house, teachers They'll get a blank one. Yeah. And um, as I said, I'm planning to put a little slideshow so it'll be consistent and, it, you know, two minutes, I'm not going to do this whole, <laughs> but about what, what you should expect. And if you have questions, call me. And I'm happy to have that discussion with parents so that um, teachers don't have to be fielding all of that. Mm -hmm. As well as, um, I'm encouraging teachers to, uh, particularly in the upper grades, give their students a blank one and say, guess what? This is what you are accountable to. Think about yourself. Where are you right now? Where's your evidence that you are achieving this? And um, having students, because a, a lot of research says that if students are involved, in self-reflecting and giving themselves feedback like in a checklist format, they learn more. Because it's not that the teacher gave me the grade, it's <laughs> what my work demonstrates. And um, an example of that is uh, one of the checklists that we're using. All of this rubric is for the teacher to see, because you certainly don't want a child who's struggling to see you're on a third grade level. That's not going to, but the student would see a all of the skills in a child-friendly language that would say, I wrote an introduction that helped readers get interested. Not yet, starting to, got it. You know? So all of those skills are now, students can self-reflect on their pieces, and that leads to stronger learning and an internalization of what these standards mean. So there shouldn't be any surprises at report card time. It should be something students really know because they've gotten feedback on their work, they've reflected on their work, and it's crystal clear what the expectations academically are. Any other questions? Do you think this level of this level of detail is too much for parents? It could be. So that's what we want our feedback on. You know, is this is this too much? Well, I will no, I'm tell you. I'm referring to the level of detail of a presentation. So can, oh. you said at the open house you're going to have a sort of a modified presentation. Because I'm thinking actually more information would be helpful. Okay. Um, well, I'm planning to put together sort of a slideshow that mm -hmm. will have a lot of information mm -hmm. and a quick narration and then links to more information mm -hmm. if parents want to. Um, look more and understand more. What I'm hoping is they can take it home, think about it, and that students would have seen them, and mm -hmm. there can be conversation at home. The other thing to know is not everything will be graded every term. There are three terms. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we might not get to opinion writing till spring, mm -hmm. so you won't get a grade on everything, all three terms. It'll be less to digest. In the fall, there might be half of these that are not in the curriculum till later in the year. So there won't be as much to, to really have to process with, with your child. And again, you know, this is being put out, but we're going to welcome, um, or I'm going to welcome the, the feedback from the community, and I'm, I'm going to elicit it after they've had at least two, two times of getting the report card. Help us understand, is this useful? Is this helpful? What could make it easier to understand? I, I really. Um, it's, it's not useful unless it's understandable to all the, all the people who will interact with it. Anything else? Okay. Thanks. Thank Please. you. You're welcome. Thanks. <coughs> you really need an extra packet. There was one right okay. here. Yeah, you have. Oh, you have I'm getting it from thing. everyone. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Make sure my own daughter did her homework. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. 
Um, before I forget, I meant to note it when we did the uh, minutes that we also had executive session minutes, and we should probably approve those separately. Do you want to do that now? Or do you Why don't we do it okay. now before I forget again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, from the same date, we had executive session minutes. You sure. Motion from Mary. To approve the executive session minutes from Wednesday, June 12, 2013. I second. James seconds. Any discussion on the minutes? Um, no, except I thought I read something in these new policies that you actually had to go into executive session to approve the executive session minutes. Not that I'm saying I need to or want to. Well, the the executive Do I session. Like that somewhere gen the well, generally executive maybe, but uh, I didn't read that. <laughs> generally, executive session minutes we vote on them when the executive session topic is no longer needed to be executive session per se. The sense. negotiations yeah. are over. We voted one, the contract on this one, yeah, and sense. you won't generally see executive session minutes until we've reached that stage. So I believe in the past we've typically voted these in public session. Yeah, we used to do it once a year. Right. We generally do it once a year, but this this happened to be in here with the June twelfth. So, and it's it's a topic that's part and parcel. So I figure we should probably vote them tonight. But that's just one. Maybe you can right. Well, I, and I think uh, Donna had said she was going to include all of the executive session minutes in next month's agenda. Right. So. Well, these just happened to sneak in here this month, so in the documents. Uh, hmm. But you're right, Kate. Okay. Yeah, can I just we zoom along? Uh, back to the proposed... Um, Policy? Policies. Mm-hmm. Um, Marty, this, uh, I think there's a typo in uh, the proposed executive Okay, tell me, because I'm going to change the uh, word executive anyway. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I'll get you a clean copy next month. So executive sessions be easy oh, I'm too. Sorry. Executive sessions will still be executive, though, right? <laughs> so in, in those um, minutes, there's something on um, page two, reasons for number two. It says um, one of the reasons we're going into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union non personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with, I think that should be union personnel not non-union again, because right. you're not going to have Correct. collective bargaining with a <coughs> non-union. And I believe non-union is hyphenated. It should. That's... Um, okay. Amendment. But so the first one, I think, is non-union. The other one, I think, should just be a union mm -hmm. person. So uh, next month's agenda will include that correction, plus the word executive will be gone, mm -hmm. replaced with administrative. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, summer, any other? Uh, summer building maintenance update. Wants to do that now, or yeah, you, you can know. do that as part. It as is part of the, part of the however you want to do it. Or or building it is. Now. It's Very part good. of the principles report that I was going to talk about. Okay. And uh, the big message is there wasn't any really big, huge, big ticket items that happened this summer. Um, we had uh, deep cleaning, of course, which um, is a challenge at Deerfield. Um, because the building is used throughout the summer, and I think our custodial staff did an outstanding job. We got a lot of comments um, at the beginning of school how great the floors looked, and um, the teachers. We didn't get a lot of, you know, complaints that the rooms weren't clean. Um, 
there was some painting done. The office was painted. Um, so right up until the first day of school, <laughs> you walked into the main office, you saw painting going on. But they've rearranged the main office and uh, here at Deerfield, and I think it looks great. Some classrooms too. Yeah, and uh, we had new blinds in various areas of the building, which were really important because, as you know, classrooms aren't air conditioned, so those blinds really help keep the temperature down in the warmer months, especially right now. And was a recommendation um, from local authorities, you know, as a security measure, that there were some rooms that had non-working blinds or missing blinds completely. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had uh, landscaping out in front, um, and there was uh, Principal Hile was going to talk about some of the Big thank you to the family, uh, the Batisti family, um, Bilek and Risley families too. That was for the front garden. Um, we had new drives installed for the air handlers um, and minor plumbing repairs. The roof leak in the sixth grade classroom was repaired, which there was a lightning rod that you know had separated from the, the roof, so they just had to seal it. And um, that's about it. The smart boards for the kindergarten classrooms that we purchased last year that we could not get a summer install date, so they're going to be installed next week by Valley Communications. And I'm happy to answer any questions. It's pretty straightforward. The doors we've mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Do we have an ETA on them? or? They're hoping that one of the long weekends, um, we don't have... Um, before Christmas, we're hoping like the Thanksgiving, and then hopefully it will be after. It'll be the Columbus Day holiday. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess and noting that there was a roof leak in the sixth grade. Um, as I walk in, I notice the roof more and more. Yeah. And um, I think I don't know if we can get an assessment done, or if we can update for the purposes of the town, because the town has been setting money aside. We sort of set <coughs> set aside, setting aside at the most recent town meeting, but I think it's getting closer and closer to a critical stage. There, there are pieces of this, this roof that are just looking as old as they are. And, you know, the, the main cafetorium or the main uh, area roof over here doesn't have the exposure that some of the other pieces do, right. but there are definitely sections of our roof that aren't too far away from needing imminent replacement. So We can check with Bob Lusco and see what the status of that is. I, I just can't remember the last time we did it, but I think it would be helpful to have Bob and um, Sean or somebody from the town get up there and walk around to get it so that the capital planning and the uh, finance committee for the town have a true sense as to how urgent it's becoming. There is another area that we are waiting to address in a third grade wing. We think it's coming from the soffit. We're not sure. Mm -hmm. So a couple surprises. The one in the sixth grade wing was a complete surprise, but um, maintenance crew and Bob Lesto were on it and had it repaired very mm -hmm. quickly, so yeah. it didn't impact the start of the school year for that teacher, which was great. Yeah. Great. Good catch. You couldn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you usually can't miss leaks, yeah. <laughs> or hopefully you don't miss them. Um, and I just wanted to add about the front garden. When you walk into the um, entranceway, there's that triangular bed that's right there. Right. And Amy Battisti, one of our families, one of the mothers of our students that we have here, she was really um, interested in trying to get some parents together to help work on that bed. It's the first thing that you see and just make it warm and welcoming. So um, in your principal's report, it was the Battisti family, Bilek family, and Risley family. And... There was some mulch donated by Lamour um, Lumber, and Mill River Farms donated some mums that you see in the bed, and they worked, the families worked well into the evening, from my understanding, weeding and planting and, and taking care of that bed, so um, it will have some beautiful color in the coming weeks, but it was nice to see uh, mm -hmm. parents taking such pride in that, so it was a nice treat for us. It always seems to get dressed up at the start of each year. Yeah. You always find the families that are willing to do That's it. Right. So, Great. <clears throat> um, I, if I follow the agenda, it says summer programs, personnel changes. Well, I we think personnel changes to... were all included in your yep. agendas. Right. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Clay had touched on this was a very busy building. 
um, this summer. I was over here a number of times, and I really thought that school was in session uh, through the entire summer up mm -hmm. until about the last two weeks. So I just have to compliment the maintenance crew because I did walk around here in the beginning of August, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. They but pulled it off. They did. Yeah. <clears throat> And I think the next thing is your mask delegate. Mm -hmm. But you don't have one because nobody's going to the conference. Nobody's going to the conference. <laughs> so you can't delegate someone unless they decide to go. We are still registering people if anyone's interested in going to that. I'm not seeing. Nobody's watching. <laughs> It just never seems to coincide with an opening in my schedule, so. It's a good conference, but it's a bad weekend for me this year. Mm -hmm. Totally understandable. I just wanted to put it out there. No. no. So we, we can table or not vote, so. No, yeah, no vote needed. Okay. And we'll get to emailing of school committee packets, and I know yeah. this is a topic near and dear to your heart. Well, I, um, <laughs> I did talk about it. I have a, a superintendent's report that I'll pass out in a minute. But one of the things that was brought to my attention is that in order to mail all the school committee agendas and all of the supplemental materials, it's, it's between $700 um, and $900, depending upon um, what's included on an annual basis with all the school committees. Everybody has an email address. And I am wondering if it's something that you would consider. We did it paper form this, this month in the future. Um, I can always bring extras of handouts to the meetings um, if that's your pleasure. But I thought I would broach it with you and see how you felt about getting the agendas uh, through email. And also, to be honest with you, with the timetables of some of the town halls that are only open in a very short period of time, not five days a week, we have our requirements to get the emails out or the uh, agendas out to you. And sometimes, like tonight was a good example, the agendas go out without having all of the information. So we had Louise's presentation that was sort of added on. If they were emailed, you could make those changes um, up to the last minute. I think it'd be great. Sometimes the mail doesn't even come last meeting. I think mine didn't come until four days later. Okay. I mean, <laughs> another issue with some, somewhere else. But, well, okay. that's just where you live, so. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. But, I mean, if everybody has an email address. Every, every committee member has an email address. Yeah. I mean, I know I get to the end of the year, and I have all of the agendas and exhibits yeah. and everything to go through. And then I, I essentially whittle down to the agendas because I figure the exhibits are all, if I don't have extensive notes written on them, mm -hmm. the exhibits are all in the office if I ever needed to go back for them. But I think if we can save 900 to $1,000 a year and 10 or 11 trees, we're making a positive statement. Good. Okay. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have to worry about getting my name spelled right on the address anymore. It's only been four years. <laughs> uh, I used to send it to the wrong number on stage road. It doesn't um. exist anymore, but we're good. <laughs> so, superintendent's report, well, I believe. I think, do you want to do your principal's report? I'm sorry, principal's report. report. Yeah. We you want to jump to that? Half jump to yeah. it. Yeah, all right, I'm since sorry, we kind of did it. a few of the items that are on there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, academically, we have, this is the time of year where students are back and we are assessing students actively, classroom teachers, interventionists, instructional assistants, special education teachers, it's really a team approach. Um, next week, the kindergarten screenings will take place and that also includes occupational therapists, speech and language um, pathologists, and um, possibly our school psychologists might be involved this time. Um, we picked next week for kindergarten screens because we use the fifth grade classroom since they're at nature's classroom. It just gives us a space to do that. So it, it kind of works out really well. And Michelle Regan-Ladd 
um, is present here, our Director of Early Childhood, and she's actively involved in the scheduling and the um, scoring of that. Um, and what we do after the assessments are done, um, K through four, I mean, we, we do have data meetings that Louise is a part of, but we really are looking at K four and digging into the data and seeing where students are and trying to identify students who might be in need of some interventions, specifically in literacy and math. And I have this, the third bullet there, intervention team model, because I just want to talk about that briefly. We um, are starting the school year with a, a different kind of approach. We're trying to create more systems in place to have interventions done more effectively and more efficiently. And one of the things in meeting with instructional assistants and classroom teachers last year, we were really trying to get a lot of feedback on how response to intervention was going. And what we kept hearing over and over again was that um, people were running all over the place, working really hard, running from wing to wing. And when we really talked about it and looked at the number of teams that they were a member of, it, it, there were too many teams to count. So we thought about how we could structure it to reduce the number of teams that people are on to be able to service students more efficiently and effectively. So really what you're looking at is when we have, we have 34 instructional assistants, they were assigned to wings. So you have um, aides are either in the 1-2 wing, in the kindergarten wing, 3-4, and 5-6. That's their wing. So they are part of that third grade team or that fourth grade team and they are now involved in consults with classroom teachers and related service providers. They're involved in the aides, common planning times, and it really is working out very well. Um, even just for the first few days of school, I had instructional assistants coming to me and special education liaisons saying, Janine, this is great. And there's just almost this sigh of relief because we're just, you know, I just keep saying to people we're working smarter instead of harder, and they did work really hard last year. So um, we're digging into the assessments now, and then we'll continue to every six weeks assess students, look at who needs to have interventions, and then the interventionist will ultimately be either the special education liaison or the instructional assistant that is in that classroom and uh, providing interventions to those students. And now with the new literacy coach that we've hired, she is going to be, I'll, I'll be working with her to design a schedule where she will have embedded into that schedule training for instructional assistance. Because we are limited with professional development days, why not build it in to the regular school day? So we're doing some embedded PD with teachers and with instructional staff. So I'm really excited about it. Um, even within the first week of school, like I said, we're hearing a lot of positive feedback, so we're hoping that we can continue to have some success with this. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the academics. Clay has school-based activities. Okay, so well, we already mentioned it. Major's classroom is next week, um, and uh, I'll be attending on Wednesday, and that works out really well because that's when the principals meet with Superintendent Barrett. So, um, and Denise Danak, our fifth grade teacher who's the nature's classroom coordinator for all four elementary schools, has done an outstanding job as usual. It's, it's an exciting, I would say, activity packed um, four nights, five days. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons uh, that we do it so early in the year is so the fifth grade kids get a chance to bond. Uh, building, building community and they have a shared experience that can be built on for the rest of the school year. So that's uh, an exciting thing. And then the next um, is our sixth grade is doing their New York City trip. Last year they went in the spring, this year they're going in the fall. And that's one day of going up and down the borough of Manhattan and surrounding islands. Um, that's always an exciting thing. The kids come back pretty tired, but uh, it's, you know, it's New York City, after all. Um, third grade is going to Mount Sugarloaf on September 26th. Um, and the ice cream social that was um, before school for our pre-K and kindergarten and new families was a well-attended event, so it was a lot of fun. The weather was really nice, it wasn't too hot. Um, and uh, there was a lot of uh, people there that you know, very relaxed time, get a chance to get to know and see friends that we haven't seen all summer. And, and then we're scheduling our safety drills. We have a fire drill scheduled for this week. Um, we're scheduling our bus evacuation drill. 
we have a tentative date for our lockdown drill. And uh, it's good to get those done early in the year because we'll have more of them and we get in really useful information early in the year on how we did during the drill that we can then try to do things if we need to differently in the future. You want to get on to the staff? Oh, they have the yeah. staff list, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we, uh, I. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so you have the list of the new staff and the new hires, and we're really thrilled with the folks that are on board. We just feel like we've hired some very talented, um, very smart, and um, people who just take a lot of initiative and some old familiar faces. Um, so it's nice to have to some people specifically back. on the cafeteria. Sure, go ahead. Uh, we hired a new cafeteria manager because Lisa Chichi took a job at Greenfield Savings Bank. And Linda Michowski is, uh, she came to us from Linden Hill School, which closed, it was a private school. And um, she hit the ground running. I mean, literally, she had, she came in on Wednesday before school started, and then she hit the ground running, and things have been going remarkably smoothly. Um, Actually, not so much. Well, <laughs> we've had some technical <laughs> difficulties. Big, and we got, we yes. worked around them, which is a challenge to new yeah. staff, but I have to pay credit to the existing cafeteria staff um, pulling together, working things out. And uh, so I just wanted to mention that specifically. Well, I joked about how um, with new teachers that I had my back to school nightmare was that because we were hiring a cafeteria manager that I would actually be running the cash register on the first day of school. Well, that actually did come true. I didn't tell you, Marty. Because the uh, computer system was down and Linda really needed a lot of help. So she and I and another staff member were standing at the register together trying to go through all the lunches and getting the numbers. So my nightmare actually came true. <laughs> but Linda's been great. And despite, I, I'm glad she has come back every day with all the challenges that she's had. Um, and the epi training, Clay, you want to talk yes. briefly about that? Okay, so if, we, if you want to relate this to um, what Louise was talking about, every uh, buddy in the school has to get trained on how to administer epi -pens. So the two school nurses, Liz Arendt and Janice Oliver, are in charge of that. There's an academic component, which is a module PowerPoint that teachers have to read. And then there is a curriculum embedded performance assessment where you have to take, you know, this is not a real of things. Every teacher was given a training one. And after you go through the module, you have to go to the nurse's office with your training EpiPen and demonstrate to them that you can actually administer it correctly. So, Superintendent Barrett, you're going to, no, I'm kidding. I failed it <laughs> last year the first time, so. So, um, that's, an expert. The, to have to go before the nurses and show them that you actually know how to administer one of these, that's a curriculum embedded performance assessment. And the standard would be, can you successfully administer an EpiPen? Um, so this is something that the nurses are doing. Everybody has to do it annually, it's required. And they take it very seriously. And um, you know, just in case you don't know, what you do is you remove this, you do this, and then you... But your thumb's not supposed to be on the yeah. top of it. Yeah. Because the needle will come out. That's right. So you, you just failed. failed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you hold it for yeah. 10 now, seconds. 10 and seconds. you count. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. very good. So that's so. not this again, this is a training type of thing. And the reason we bring this up really is just to make you aware of how seriously we do take it, but we have so many field trips that are coming up very quickly that mm -hmm. we're trying to just get all of this done and the folks that are having field trips to get them trained before they go so we know that everybody's safe. Uh, and the last item that I just want to talk about, you've heard a lot about the new educator evaluation model that we spoke and shared with you last year and, and pages and upon pages of documents on DESE's website about that. And, um, you know, I do see this as a really positive thing and I do see this as really you know, something that is going to change education for the better. Is it a lot of paperwork? Is it a lot? Is it, is it creating anxiety right now among staff, including administration? Sure, because there are a lot of things that are unanswered, and we're going through it and diving into it for the first time this year. Um, but what I just wanted to speak about was the training that's going to take place in the next week for our staff. 
So tomorrow we have our first staff meeting. Um, Louise and Sarah Mitchell are going to be coming over. The, the faculty will be in the computer lab. I invite them to bring iPads and laptops. And we're going to get them on the OASIS, the online system, which we will use to upload all of artifacts, all of their goals. It'll be a communication device between administration and teachers. And the feedback that I received from Sarah over at Frontier is that they love it. It's just so easy to use, um, very user friendly, and it's just it's it's helping with this massive amount of paperwork. So tomorrow that will happen after school, and people will be online looking, learning how to log in, seeing what the pages are like, um, seeing how you are able to upload an artifact, and just learning some of the simple things. And then next week, Louise and Sarah will be back to Deerfield Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, after school. Um, providing optional opportunities for faculty to again come back into the computer lab and to start digging in if they're ready to start putting in their team goals or their individual goals and provide some coaching with that. Um, if there's faculty that would like to work in their classrooms with their team, um, we can be available to do that. So we're hoping that um, we'll have all of our goals up and, up and running in the next few weeks. They are due by October 15th. Um, but I want to just talk briefly about the administrative team we met at Admin Retreat and we were creating goals because for principals we have to, and administrators, create five goals. So we have a student learning goal, a professional practice goal, and three school improvement goals. Um, and just some of the goals that we were coming because we were creating team goals and the state's really encouraging team goals. Uh, some of the goals, just to give you an idea of what um, the language is like, is by 2015, the administrative team will function as a professional learning community by meeting monthly to perform many observations, discuss best practices, analyze data on student performance as measured by meeting notes, a schedule of team meeting many observations, and an alignment of DESE's conditions of effective schools and other artifacts. It's a mouthful. It really is a mouthful. That's just one goal. That's just one goal. Um, some of the other goals that we're focusing on here that I have in my, um, my plan is by June of 2015, 75% of classroom instruction and learning will be directly linked to the Massachusetts standards as measured by district-wide observation forms. That's also a team goal of the administrative team. Another team goal was that by 2015, 100% of teachers will be evaluated using the DESE approved teacher evaluation system and the OASIS online system. And then um, my individual goal, which I will be sharing with teachers tomorrow, is that by 2015, and this is aligned with our school improvement plan, 100% of K through six classroom and special education teachers will participate in embedded and collaborative professional development opportunities focused on literacy instruction at least four times this school year. And that's the work that will be done with the literacy coach that I kind of alluded to earlier and also explained when we were looking to um, hire that person last year. So it's something that's built into our school improvement plan. And I also have, and I'm encouraging our teachers to consider almost piggybacking off some of the goals that we have as administrators because if we're all on the same page, that's really going to improve instruction and move us forward and really impact students. And I think if we all, we're all in it together, we're trying to support each other. And I do believe it's going to be a good thing for education. Um, but it's a lot and it's very overwhelming. So we're just starting that process this year. And I know, Jamie, you've been involved in it at Amherst for at least one year. Yep, we did last year. And it, it had bumps, but there, yeah. you know, we were able to see what we did um, and kind of smooth them out and make some suggestions about even corrections within the system yeah. and the way you input data. So. So, um, are there any questions? I just threw a lot of words at you. I didn't have them printed out to, to hand to you, but um, any questions about anything you want to know? I mean, overall, we're, Clay and I have been talking. We're really thrilled at the start of the school year. It's been a really nice launch. We've heard so many compliments from parents and from staff, and we're off to a great start. So, I look forward to the year. Thank you. Well, with all my talk about paper, I brought paper. <laughs> um, you will see my reports. Um, I like to give written or emailed reports so that, um, you know, if you go back later and have questions, 
I'm happy to try to answer them when you get home. One to go. One to go, one more? One to go this way. Okay. So we did have a smooth opening, I thought, of all the um, schools. I did on the first day of school, had the opportunity to go to all five schools, and I sat in on 18 classes. Um, my hope, I was in Waitley today, is to visit a couple of schools every week. Um, <clears throat> as Janine had mentioned, I'm part of the, uh, I have to do the goal setting um, and meet the same standards that the administrators and teachers do. So. Um, I'm going to show you just some of my goals. I did some screen prints from my iPad of uh, the OASIS system. Um, one of the things that we've changed this year is that we have monthly administrators meetings. So the first half of our monthly meetings, we're going to rotate from school to school, and we are going to do many classroom observations. So each time um, we have a meeting, we should be able to get into three or four classrooms per school. It's really important to have that discussion afterwards amongst administrators to make sure, again, that we're calibrating the same things and that we're seeing the same things. And it takes a while. And I'll, I also have a handout of the <clears throat> uh, observation form that the teachers um, will be getting by the um, administrators that are coming through. Again, these are all on our iPads, but just to get a sense of some of the things that they'll be looking for. Janine had talked about this as part of the new evaluation system. We have purchased a district-wide. It's a software program called My Learning Plan. Um, and I just, again, not to inundate you with paper, but just to show you the, um, what it looks like for, to have my goals. Now, I have my goals in there, but obviously I haven't addressed them yet, but just to give you a sense of what we're, we're all going through. Um, I'm really pleased we have uh, hired Scott Paul as our new director of technology. This is a position that you all voted on last year to create. We did not have that position in place. He began his employment August 2nd, um, and we have just hired a new technician uh, he just started yesterday. His name is Mike Peliquin. Um, so he will be doing kind of the nuts and bolts repairs um, in all five schools. And Louise had said earlier, I received notification from the commissioner, uh, Mitchell Chester, that our district uh, was one of the wonderful districts chosen to participate in the park test, the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Career. Um, this is a field test in language arts, literacy, and mathematics, grades 3 through 11. So 20 states are part of this consortium that has developed this assessment tool um, that are aligned for the Common Core Standards. So in the spring of 2014, we will administer, well, the Pearson, who is the testing company, will administer the field test to 15% of the students statewide in grades 3 through 11. And uh, only a sample will be chosen, typically two classrooms per grade. And no, no student will take the entire test or both comp uh, components. So they either have the performance-based assessment or the end-of-the-year assessment in just one subject area. Eventually, and that's why they're starting to field test it, um, the park will be entirely computer-based. We currently have the NWE test, which is computer-based in all of the schools. So that won't be a huge shift for our children. What will be a shift, and what we can't accommodate now, is to have everyone testing on computers simultaneously. None of our schools can accommodate that. The state is aware of that. Um, so I did the drum, drum roll yesterday. I got notification that Waitley grade four, Conway grade six, and Frontier grade eight were the schools that are, uh, were chosen. And, um, each of them have a different subject area. They either have ELA or math, but not both. Um, and also, just, just a heads up, you know, when you start a new position, a lot of people come to you with a lot of ideas and suggestions. And one of the things that was brought to my attention is that the central office position um, haven't really been looked at in a long time as far as job descriptions and responsibilities. And I think with the um, integration of technology, those positions have changed and evolved. So 
we're examining it right now. I have nothing to present, <clears throat> but just to give you a heads up that we're going to be talking about it in the future. And one of the things that uh, we started this year, and, and I hope it continues, um, we had a new teacher orientation on August 27th, and this was for all teachers and all grade levels across the district. It was very informal, very low key. Uh, we had a short presentation by each principal. I asked them to talk about weird or strange things that might not be known about their school. So it was lighthearted. They had breakfast, and then I got on a bus with all of them, and we went on a tour of the district <coughs> because there are grade level meetings, and I think it's important that everybody know where everybody's school is. And um, we had a great time. So it was well received. Um, and then we had already talked about the uh, emailing of the agendas. So I have to tell you, I am loving this position. It's, um, I'm on beginning month three uh, today. But I'm having a great time, and everybody's been really welcoming, and um, so I'm glad you hired me. <laughs> I'm very happy. Any questions? I'm not hearing any. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I don't have anything else. Does anyone have anything? I sort of sit here and go numb as I read or I hear new report cards, new teacher evaluation system, new intervention organization, and all of these things being integrated or taken, taken on at the same time, and I sort of wonder where the teachers find time to teach the kids. Um, I mean, it's lovely that we're in a data-driven world, but increasingly it seems to be taking over all of our lives. Um, so I just hope our teachers don't lose sight of this, the students and, and what the data is going to show us about the students. But how do you, how do you get it all done in a day yeah. without uh, really? Since they do the teachers mm -hmm. want to comment on that. <laughs> it's Thank you for saying that. What's that? That's why I'm here tonight working. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's, it's overwhelming to sit here and listen to it. And I'm just trying to assimilate. There's a lot to learn. And every year, it's, it's, it's never ending. And DESE just keeps churning it out. And the federal government keeps churning it out. And it, it impacts all of us. And it's, not, and it's not just in the field of education. It's everywhere. But it just boggles my mind when I sit here and I listen to Louise who must, I mean, as all of you do, must live, eat, and breathe. Um, just setting up the systems, mm -hmm. and then you have to deal with the MCAS and the analysis, and I, I've, I've always said your teachers definitely earn their money, and it's not a profession that I could ever accomplish because I can't envision myself keeping 20 or 30 minds active uh, in addition to my own every day, in an organized <laughs> way. So, but, yes, it, no, it is. I mean, I, I get the rewards of it. I just, this, it's pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I credit administration, teachers, instructional assistants, the whole group here just does a phenomenal job. So. Yeah, I just want to comment that um, there are a lot of initiatives. I mean, every year, the DOE, they're just tossing out initiatives for teachers. And just being in the rooms these first few days of school, and, and you'll see it on the last day of school, what our teachers are really good at is taking them on, and are we all kind of grumbling together at certain times and going, oh, you know, of course. But um, what you see also in the classroom are those social skills and those learning habits that Louise mentioned on that first page of the report card. And they're teaching kids how to be kind to each other. They're teaching kids how to have empathy and to have, how to have sympathy and to be compassionate. And I think those are the most important lessons. And you see it day in and day out while still balancing all these other initiatives and that as a challenge. Mm -hmm. so. Most definitely. Yeah. So. I forgot to hand out one more piece of paper. <laughs> Darn. I know. And I don't know if you have any interest, but one of the uh, school committee members in Waitley uh, brought this to my attention. There's a... Um, 
called Charting the Course. It's on September 21st, and I don't know if you're ever notified of this, but it's free. It's uh, for new and veteran school committee members, and um, there are a couple of Waitley school committee members going, so if you have any interest, um, I am handing that out to you. And we're not going to give you anything else. I'll save these for October. Okay. <laughs> Works for me. It's too much information sometimes. Um, if no one has anything else, I can entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. We have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. We have two seconds. <laughs> Take your choice. <laughs> Who made the motion? <laughs> I did. Okay. David. David. Okay. And can I ask who did the Bernadette second? Bernadette and Bernadette. Jane, okay. either one of them. She's first off about it. Yeah, we'll okay. let her go. I don't know if she's got credit in any of the other ones, so we'll give it. I saw her head nod first, so that yeah. She did second to approve the minutes. So mm -hmm. Oh, good. <laughs> so she's okay. down twice tonight. So we have a motion and a second to wish to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Thank you all very much, and welcome back to another school year. Thank you.